Hey everybody, welcome to Loose Cast. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm Tyler. I'm Nate. And I'm Drew. <laughs> okay. This is gonna be a fiasco right from the start. We have a we have a fourth person here. We don't know who the hell he is. Like he just showed up off the street. Yeah. I snuck in. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we have a ty- a, a wild Tyler sighting has been uh, here. He, he's actually on the pod. So so welcome back, Mr. Tyler. Uh, we we have we have missed you. There there has been a hole in our family since you've been gone. It's good to be back. All right. So we have quite an episode for you guys tonight. We're going to be talking about our very first Linux experiences and then kind of go on our Linux journeys, how we got to where we are today. So uh, it's going to, we're going to be putting on our nostalgic hats and having a little bit of time going through history. But before we do, we're going to go around the horn and talk about what we've done this week in Linux or FOSS or literally Tyler, what the fuck has been going on? Where have you been? <laughs> 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 What's going on with you, man? Well, you know, uh, met a girl and the computers didn't really matter as much. So that's pretty much it. You know, it happens. Have you used Linux at all in the last six weeks? Yeah, kind of. I removed it off of the MacBook. So, uh, (laughs) you know, someone else could use the MacBook because I'm not going to hand that thing over to somebody who's not familiar with a lot of key bindings and be like, all it takes is key binds. Have fun. So, yeah, no, I I did actually remove Mastodon off of my phone only because I was getting, I don't really like to use any of the, like, Twitter or, like, that kind of style of posting. So I just went ahead and removed it because I was getting a lot of notifications from it. Nothing to do with me, just, like, you know, random posts on Mastodon and if I do go back to Mastodon, I've pretty much made the decision I'm going to be moving to a different one because I'm on some weird, super random, like Linux social pizza something something else. Like I'm going to get a better server. I recommend Fostodon, but I'm a little bit biased. I've heard it's really good. So, so Tyler got a life and then had no had no time for his Linux friends. That's just sad. Fair. Pretty much how it worked out. <laughs> That's fine. All right, Drew, what about you? What you been up to this week? Real world issues, uh, post-hurricane stuff, work is challenging. Let's leave it at that. I've been testing servers and NextCloud and Jitsi, primarily focusing on Jitsi and determining how to get the best quality image. And as you can see, I have failed freaking miserably (laughs) over the last uh, week especially. And I want to say that I'm done. I just can't. I'm not done. But anyway, I've been asking questions on the Jitsi community boards, exchanging thoughts. And regardless of what happens, I feel like I'm getting quite a education when it comes to um, putting up servers and codecs and the whole nine yards. Anyway, that's been an interesting, like I said, education. The next cloud vid that I promised last week is in the can, as they say, but will not be coming out today. I think we all know why. (laughs) And motivation may be an issue. And I'm just going to leave it at that. All right. Nate, what about you? What you been up to? So I actually installed MX Linux on my ThinkPad W530, mostly because I wanted a Debian-based system. And yes, I know, Drew, I could have just used Debian. But MX Linux actually has a really good tool set for older NVIDIA GPUs. And it makes it super easy. It's a one-click install. You literally... Click, hey, I have a NVIDIA GPU. It will go through all the drivers. It'll find which one matches. It will install it, set it up for you. You do literally nothing at all. And so I've actually been using it quite a bit. And then also, uh, I started this thing. Hmm. Pray for me. Good luck there, Nate. Good luck. All right, so I've been doing a couple things. First off, I've been working on a personal blog with Hugo for my just my regular stuff. So. I've kind of actually fallen in love with Hugo. I hated it to begin with because I was so used to love Eleventy, but Hugo is actually really good. But I'll talk more about that at the, on the Nuggies of the week. The other thing that I've been doing is wrapping up my Bluefin uh, long-term review. I've been using Bluefin now for several months. Like it's been three months or so, maybe even longer than that. I have it on an ex- uh, another hard drive on this computer. I've been using it as my editing machine, and I had it on my laptop for a while. And I've just been trying to get that get that around to the point where it is 
feasible to start recording it. I have all my notes and stuff ready to go, and I've gotten some B-roll shot. So hopefully within the next couple weeks, that will be done. And then I've been trying to think about what I've been want to do for my next long-term review. I'm not actually sure. Somebody said Gen 2. Like, I've done Gen 2 for like 30 days, but I've never spent like a, a, a vast amount of time in Gen 2 before. So that's a possibility. Some Someone tr- uh, recommended me spending time in Arch again because it's been a long time since I've been in Vanilla Arch. I don't know if I want to do that because it's just Vanilla Arch. Everybody's used Vanilla Arch. It seems redundant to do a long-term review. So I'm not exactly sure where I'll go. With you. And uh, someone said, well, Matt, you did a poll that was supposed to be Void Linux, but I am scared shitless of Void Linux, to be honest with you. <laughs> Like I, that, there, that thing is just more complicated than I really feel like I want to do. I've never been successful in installing it um, and actually having it be functional after install. So uh, we'll see. Maybe it's going to be void. Maybe it'll be Gen 2. I don't know. Uh, that won't be for a while yet anyway. So that's basically all I've been doing. Other than that, a ton of work. It has been a really, really long week. So I, I get all of December off from my job. It's going to be great. But... Because that's true, my, my boss in his inst- infinite r- wisdom decided to do that and then realized that, oh shit, we still have to have stuff to publish in December. So we've basically, since the end of like August, been trying to do all of December's work between those times. And it's just added a whole bunch of things. And everybody's on vacation. It's, it's horrendous. It's just the stupidest thing. So there you go. That's this week in FOSS, such as it is. So what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about our very first Linux distros and our experiences as we switched over to Linux full-time. So those two things may not go together. Like for me, my first Linux distro didn't happen when I switched to Linux full-time. So I'll kind of be mixing and matching distros for a little bit when I go to, when it's my turn. But first, I, I, I guess we just go around the horn and ask... What was your very first Linux distro? Drew, why don't you go first? Um, Linux Mint. And I think I'm probably like a lot of people that are switching from Windows. You get to Google and you say, best Linux distribution for beginners. And that's what popped out. And so I was like, okay, well, let's let's go with that. And, um, and I, you know what? The more I think of it, I think... I keep saying uh, I was like 2017, 2018. I think it was actually earlier than that now, because if I had to look, I would probably bet that Windows 8, between 8 and 10, I got really like fed up with the whole thing. And I probably switched somewhere in that timeline. When did Windows 10 come out anyway? It says... 2015. So I might be I might be an older Linux user than I'm even giving myself credit for. Um, so anyway, at the time, I think Linux Mint was in the 17s, like 17, 1, 2, or 3, somewhere in there. And I obviously just went with whatever was the, you know, the flagship, the flagship ISO and uh, tried Linux Mint uh, with Cinnamon, the Cinnamon desktop. And that's where I started. Now, I don't know that I st- stayed a great deal of time, but it was at least six months. I can say that for a fact. Nice. All right. What about you, Nate? What was your first Linux distro? So mine was actually Ubuntu, funny enough, but mine was the Ubuntu 6.06.2 LTS, also known as Dapper Drake. So when I first started using it, it was because that Vista came out and I could not for the life of me get Vista properly working on my hardware at all. It was so, so buggy and sluggish. And I remember that I was contemplating reinstalling Windows XP and I went to school and they had some of those, uh, I think it's like PC, I think it might have even been like PC Magazine or something like that. And they had a Ubuntu CD in the back of it. And so I decided to uh, take the CD without asking and <laughs> I installed it <laughs> onto my system and uh my first impressions were like, wow, this is really cool. Until I realized I knew nothing about Linux and it was completely different than Windows and I had DSL internet and Firefox. It was better than Internet Explorer, but I still was all over the place. Yeah, that was my first actual introduction to the f- concept of free and open source and you know Linux in general. But I didn't know what I was doing at that time. 
All right, Tyler, what about you? What was your first Linux distro? I might be telling on myself with how long ago this was, but I had an Acer Aspire 1 netbook that I loved. It was my first, like, my own computer, and I loaded Ubuntu onto it because I continuously broke Windows XP, which it came with, uh, because it was just, it, it was fun to break Windows XP. I would mess around with stuff, and then it just wouldn't function at least properly for sure and i mean the poor thing had like an intel atom cpu in it like the cpu was like one one or like 1.2 gigahertz one core like it was a pretty easy computer to like stress so i got i don't even know what version of ubuntu it was but i know it was back when you know they were still using gnome 2 and you know puke orange was the best color in the world so it's been a while but I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of problems when I first switched over, obviously, because all I ever knew was Windows XP or Windows 7. And like that, I, I'm pretty sure that was like when Windows 7 was like new. So I played around with it a lot. Yeah, that, yeah, it was because it was when Windows 7 just came out because the poor thing couldn't run it. It just couldn't. So, I mean, it would install, but be able to use anything? No, no, like Notepad was slow but that thing like ubuntu did give that whole pc a whole new life i just had some problems with it i tried switching around i the next one i tried was what drew tried linux mint and i i liked linux mint a little bit more user interface wise but i can't remember why i i ended up going back to ubuntu for a bit i think it was because like unity was either just coming out or it was like supposedly like got an update was supposed to be better and i ended up sticking with that for a while okay so my first linux distro happened in like 2002 ish uh i was working at little caesars and i was still in high school and one of the guys i worked with he was a big nerd and i also considered myself a big nerd and he says well have you used linux and I said, no. So he handed me a, uh, probably a CDRW at that point, And it had SUSE Linux on it. I don't know what version. All I remember really about it was that I installed it and it came pre-installed with GNOME and KDE at the same time, which I find interesting these days. And both of them, you gotta remember this was a long time ago. So it just a vague recollection. I didn't stay with it for very long. I, I remember probably what was, what was KDE looking, trying to look as similar to Windows 95 as possible. And at that point, I believe like Windows XP was just either just announced or just released or something like that. Maybe it was a little bit beforehand. And because of that, what I was using on the Linux side looked really outdated because Windows XP, I don't know if you guys remember this, but Windows XP came out like everybody was blown away because it looked so modern and awesome. There was colors and <laughs> like, oh my goodness, the, the start button has colors. And so when Windows XP came out like uh, six months later after this, I went immediately back to Windows because it was so cool and so much modern, more modern looking. And so that was my first introduction to Linux. I don't remember much about the experience other than I know I was still on dial-up at, at that point. I had just gotten a computer like a couple of years earlier. We only got our first computer here at the house like in the year 2000. So I can also vaguely remember my mother giving me hell because she went to use it and it no longer looked and worked the way that it last time it worked the one, when she used it last. Which, <laughs> so of course, so I didn't go back to Windows at that point. I switched for good in 2017, and at that point, I used Ubuntu Budgie first, which is an interesting choice. I don't know why I chose Ubuntu Budgie, because if, if you're like Drew and you go searching for best Linux distro, Ubuntu Budgie is probably not going to be one of them that come up, <laughs> no. so I have no clue why I chose that one. I did. I, I remember this experience with Ubuntu Budgie, and for whatever reason, so it, on... Windows, you open up File Explorer and it opens up, but it, there's a delay there. Like it's slow to load. At least it was on my computer at that point. I I installed Ubuntu Budgie and Nautilus opened up like instantaneously, and I could not get enough 
of that experience of opening the file manager. This is the beginning of my obsession with file managers. Clearly. Um, yeah, it just, <laughs> it just, I just, I just can remember, I can remember myself closing Nautilus, opening it over and over again, open, close, open, close, open, close, <laughs> because it would just open instantaneously. I was so impressed with that speed for whatever reason. Like, I don't even know. It has to be something to do with the ADD just going on. It's like a fidget spinner just opening Nautilus, open Nautilus. <laughs> it was stupid. But anyways, that was really my first true experience that I really really remember and then stuck with because it's just that was it's a weird experience i'll i'll admit all right so let's ask this question then and go back we'll go back right around in the in the same order do you remember any of the hardships that you faced when you first did switch to linux full time so drew if you can remember what were some of the hardships that you faced when you first switched i think like the one thing that was that sticks in my mind is printers and scanners and I couldn't get it to work like right out of the box. And that was kind of like a, that's something that kind of kept going for especially the la the next couple years where it was just like, Oh crap, man, I can't get this. And I was usually on a network printer at my office and it was, it was really challenging to get it to uh, work correctly. And this was a brother printer and traditionally those are really really easy to um to get working in linux so that was one thing um the other is like everybody else you have other people that aren't using linux and they're like here's your excel file and i'm like oh what do i do with that <laughs> what do i do with that and uh, so that was the other part of it you know it's like okay well i everybody else on the freaking world is using windows and the office suite and i'm not and so how how am i going to rectify that so that was that was really the 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 uh, the challenges that kind of that i recall okay nate what about you did you, do you remember any of the big challenges you had when you first switched to linux so yeah, and it actually made me for years always keep a Linux machine and a Windows machine together. And a lot of it has to do, because even back in the day, I was a hardcore gamer. And so video and audio was a big thing for me. I cannot remember how many freaking audio cards I bought trying to get audio working on Linux. And then the whole also drivers and calling it and all that nonsense. That was such a pain back in the day <laughs> just to get it working. And then I also had to, on my motherboard, for some reason it didn't like that the Ethernet chip at all. And I could not get Ethernet. And so I wound up having to buy, what is it, PCIe, just the 1X. I had to buy an Ethernet port for it. And it finally, and I think I got the Intel something or another, and it worked. And... That's, yeah. And because of that, I always, like, because I've always been into video and audio production. And so I've always had to have that Windows machine that's there to make sure that everything works. And, but I will say from what it, from where it has been and how difficult it was nowadays, it's so smooth. So much oh, better. Oh, yeah. It's gotten way better. Yeah. All right. What about you, Tyler? Do you remember any of your Linux hardships from there at the beginning? I have an extra one, but it's also a combination of, of Drew and Nate's That's fine. problems. My, kind of, because mine wasn't an Ethernet adapter. Mine was Wi-Fi adapters. I needed, like, USB Wi-Fi adapters. And, I mean, you could go down to any electronic store near you, and almost all of them would work on Windows. Not a single one would work on Linux. Not a single one. You'd have to order it off of some weird sketchy website or like hope Amazon had one if Amazon was that big back then. I mean, I'm sure it was, but like, you know, you'd have to go like find some Chinese vendor who's, who's selling them. Then the other one was printer drivers and steam games. And for most of that back, back when I first started using Linux as like trying to make it my primary, I ended up having to dual boot a lot because Steam game, like Proton wasn't a thing. And so you had to use Wine to hopefully like be able to get the game running. And even then probably wouldn't run right at all. And I also used Wine to try and install printer drivers at one point because the print, my grandmother had an HP printer 
and I needed to print off something a few times. And I remember going through the process of installing HP printer drivers, the application I would need to be able to load the file to print. Like it was a nightmare. I don't ever know if that ever worked out for me. I can't remember, but I just remember the insanity of installing Windows printer drivers inside of Wine. Yeah. Thank God. Thank God that's over. <laughs> I've gotten to the point now where I've just stopped printing things. Like even like even these days, printers aren't something that universally work. Like you wish that that was true, but it's just it's it's not true. They're better. They're better. Don't get me wrong. They're better than they used to be. But now, like it's still hit or miss depending on what brand you're getting, uh, how long the the printer has been offline. Because the printer that I have has a self updating mechanism because it will connect to Wi Fi. And it will do that before it will allow a computer to connect to it. So if it hasn't been on for a while, like a game console, it has to go to the internet to search for the 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 update for the the, the printer. And the thing is, if you, if you leave it off long enough, chances are your Wi-Fi password has changed. So you have to go on either on the app which you're gonna have to figure out what app to use because printer companies change apps like crazy or you have to get on their little uh the little screen that that's like a two by two inch screen and you have to use the the d-pad that's on the outside to change the the wi-fi password and all of that going on to say that the linux won't connect to it while that update is going on and it just leads to all sorts of messes. So I've, I've just gotten to the point now where I have a printer back there. It has not been on, oh, probably in six years. Maybe less than that. It, I doubt very much that it works. It's probably full and caked of dust and would never actually print anything. And the, the inkjet ink cartridges are probably about as dry as you can imagine. Like it's probably not very good. So if, if I had to print something, and every once in a while, like you, you'll have to return... I hate this side rant. Uh, you know, every once in a while, you have to return something to Amazon, and they won't just let you drop it off at UPS without a label. And you, they'll say, "Well, if you wanted to drop it off at UPS, you have to print a label." And I was like, "And how am I supposed to fucking do that?" You know, <laughs> like, okay, just hold on a second while I go out and buy a brand new printer because the one that I have doesn't work. And at that point, I'll just keep whatever it is I was supposed to be returning. So, all right, so. It's it's hard for me going last out of this group because most of my problems were your guys' problems, but I'm going to go with Nate's. Audio problems by far were the hardest part for me when I first switched. Just the fact, so I've been podcasting since 2009, not this one here, but I've been doing another podcast since 2009, and I had to have that stuff work, right? You have It's just an audio po podcast. I had to be able to actually say, you know, plug in a microphone and have it record it, and that simple proposition, even in 2017, was not something that was guaranteed to work 100% of the time. At that point, it was Pulse Audio, and it just was flakier than cornflakes. It's, it's, it was such an uneven experience at that point. And I know coming in, at 20, in 2017 and saying that audio sucks is about the biggest cliche ever, and also kind of the biggest kick in the nuts to those people who were back in the 90s who had to put up with Alsa and all the stuff that came before, you know. But even in 2017, the audio was just not good in terms of stability. And that was my that was my biggest problem and remained my biggest problem for a long time. I will say this, and everybody knock on their head for just a minute. Audio over the course of the last year and a half or so has been really freaking good. Pipewire has finally got to the point where it doesn't break at every single update. So I'm very happy with that. Um, I guarantee now that I've said something, you probably can't hear me anymore. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, it's, it's gotten way better. But audio has definitely thing. But Tyler, on the, the Wi-Fi thing... It gets worse when it's an external Wi-Fi dongle. Those things are, <laughs> like, even now, half of those things will not work, especially if you are a dumbass, like me, who gets on Ali, Ali AliExpress and decides he's going to buy, like, the $2 version because he's a cheap motherfucker. <laughs> and, like, I, I wasn't want to spend money on it, but I needed a... I Okay, so it was for my standing desk back there. I don't have... I didn't want to run a... Ethernet cable all the way around the room or through a wall or something. So I, I decided to hook it up to Wi-Fi. 
And uh, so I got a card off AliExpress. It was $2.99. I think it was free shipping, which is fucking hilarious. <laughs> and yeah, that didn't work. Like it not even, I mean, I, I did, I probably spent 10 hours in total trying to get that thing to work. It never did work. So what I ended up doing was I have a, um, a Google Wi-Fi system. Like I have three of those little modules for Google Wi-Fi and it has an extra ethernet port on each little you know thing so i hooked up i put set that on top of the standing desk and plugged it in via wi-fi but it was still getting it via, via ethernet and that was my internet for the standing desk all the way through my first like month and a half of having a home lab because that's where my home lab is right there and so i was on wi-fi for my home lab for quite a while which is not by the way <laughs> the way you want to do things i did finally decide to just to run the ethernet cable now i have a hundred foot ethernet cable about 98 feet of it i don't actually Really need it still in the roll. <laughs> That's because I can't measure shit. All right. So we did that. We did the negative. So let's go around and do the positives. When you first switched to Linux, what were the immediate things that you recognized as being absolutely better than where you came from? So, you know, whatever that happens to be. So once again, we'll go around in the same direction. Drew, what were some of the things that immediately impressed you when you switched to Linux? It just worked. You know, it's, it's, it's just as simple as that. I mean, it would just work. By the way, is there something other than Pulse Audio? Because I don't know anything about that. You, <laughs> you know? Debian guys, you're so cute. <laughs> what, 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 are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know? So anyway, uh, you know, it just worked, man. And it didn't crash every five freaking seconds, basically. You know, and that's that was really what prompted me because, I mean, you know, the Windows bloat was causing my hardware to just crash twice a day easy you know twice a day i'm just like oh, i gotta reboot because it's just like it's unusable any other way and this allowed me to just wow i can actually work that's pretty darn good if i can just work then that's one of the things that you know that pushed me into that you know got to find something else because this is not working at all and maybe it was the hardware but i'm gonna stick with <laughs> it was the software and i just needed something to 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 keep me from like pulling my hair out and, uh, and, and getting something done and during the day. So yeah, it just worked and it was fast and responsive. And, you know, to Matt's point, you know, when you open up a file browser, it actually opened up the file browser and didn't take like a beat or two or three or 10, you know? So yeah, it was very responsive. And that was, that was all I needed to get going with, uh, with my, hunt which is the next thing is you hunt for the perfect distro you know once you move that once you move over and you're like wow this is great what's better than this and that's when it that's when you go down the rabbit hole all right what about you nate what were some of the things that you found on linux immediately were better than where you came from funny enough because i'm a nerd the terminal 100 percent. you are a nerd <laughs> i think we all well, are it, it, it's it was the fact that it, for one yes it did just work for one thing my hardware wasn't like burning up and crashing every five minutes but another thing that it kind of it was the fact that i i could go in and do things myself without actually having to you know depend on some other software of over here and you, then you got to install this software over here like i could just go into the terminal and do what i needed to do and that triggered the inner nerd in me when I was younger. And so with that being said, uh, another thing was after I got the audio working, it was a weird satisfaction of I did something. I don't know if anybody else understands that. It's just, there's something weird about that. Oh, I actually compiled this. I actually set it up the certain way I wanted it to be. And it's working. And so to me, that has always been a thing with me. And, you know, that's why I have like four systems. It's all running Linux right now. I, I don't, <laughs> the funny thing is when you mentioned that, I thought immediately of Jake and his custom kernels. Cause you know, that's exactly the reason why he does. <laughs> right? Yeah. It, but he goes to the extreme, like I'm okay with just leave my kernel stock. He goes to the extreme of like, I'm pulling everything out besides exactly what I need. <laughs> like, I'm not doing it, bro. <laughs> but you, you, know, but you know, when he, he finishes that and it works and it actually boots, he gets that immediate, you know, yeah. hit, That's a, true. hit of dopamine or whatever to as a success story. So, yeah, I, I'm right there with you. The whole 
if, if you if you have a problem and you immediately solve it and you did that and you did it without having someone else do it for you it feels really good and you don't have that experience on windows right like on windows the only solution to a windows problem if if it's not like a power down and turn it back on is to completely nuke and pave. Those are the only two solutions to any problem on Windows. I mean, I'm sure if you're a Windows like admin or whatever, there are other things that you can do. But as a normal person, I mean, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to find this, whatever this is in the registry and turn it off. Most people aren't going to do that. They're just, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just getting the, the, the Windows 7 CD out again and typing in the same uh, activation code that I always do and then when they tell me I'm already using that I have to call them to activate it and just lie my ass off and say I'm only using it on one computer you know <laughs> well even better is the technical problems where when you google them you go to some like Microsoft-esque forum and everyone there is just like have you tried deleting system 32 yet like I've I've heard that works it's like oh Great, now my computer doesn't turn on anymore. Yeah. Thank you. The, the Windows Thank equivalent you. of RMRF. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, Tyler, what about you? What do you remember from your first time of, of using Linux that immediately caught you as being superior to wherever you came from? Well, I remember the GNOME 2 user interface being way more clean. And like, I don't know that, again, because like when I first started using it, I was very familiar with, the I'm GNOME just saying, GNOME shill, GNOME shill. <laughs> <laughs> like, look, it was great. It, it really was. It, like, the u user interface made a lot more sense than Windows did. Like, there was a lot more less encumbrance just trying to get around and use the UI. And that was even, even better with Linux Mint. Because Linux Mint is like, you're familiar with the layout because it's similar to Windows. But you also don't have to deal with any of the like weird Windows idiosyncrasies where just like things don't. I remember on Windows would like you would right click on something, have a drop down menu, click on an option, and it does nothing. Like, hello, like you're made by a massive, very, very popular and wealthy company. How do you have buttons that do nothing? That makes no sense. But. Yeah, that for me was the first, like I could actually get around my system and do the things I wanted, especially when it come, comes to file management. That was can, much can improved. Can I add something to that real mm -hmm. quick? Yeah. Do y'all remember that, especially in Vista and XP, they had these special versions of Windows that could customize Windows? Yes. And it brought up something because I remember how many of them were actually spyware <laughs> and how many of them were just straight up malware. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Viruses and like being able to go to Linux and you're like, oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, I don't actually, I didn't nuke my system. All my files ain't gone. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That was a huge thing back then. All my files aren't encrypted and now exactly. since my computer's trying to charge me money. <laughs> <laughs> Some Russian guy on the phone, hey, you owe me money, bro. <laughs> uh, yeah. The, I remember buying, so I, I think it was Windows XP, but Windows XP had like, you could buy it like the regular version and then they had like the media center edition. You could buy an add-on pack to make your regular version media center edition. Literally all it was, was it, at least at first, all it did was come with like Windows media player or whatever uh, on top of it. And then eventually they added like a TV mode that you could use. But yeah, those things like, honestly, what's, okay, I don't want this to turn into like, let's bash Microsoft, let's bash Windows, but just for a minute, let's do it anyways. I'm honestly surprised given the way they've tried to monetize every inch of Windows these days that they don't actually have paid add-ons that you can add on like a, a an experience pack where you get some extra emojis or some s extra sound packs or whatever. And it seems like exactly like something they would do just to add some extra money. Like they, they, yeah. they used to do it. Like why not anymore? Yeah. If Microsoft started charging for different, like their own, like built in email client, if they started charging for like different notification sounds from there, would not surprise me at all. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if I started getting pictures of like cutouts or like screenshots of just like the pricing. It's like, yeah, do you want to pay $2.99 for, you know, a clip of enter artist name here, new song? Actually, there's actually a better plan than that to get your email. Without advertisement, you have to pay two ninety nine 
a month so that you don't get advertisement. Mm. I would not and be by the surprised. Way, by the way, subscription from Windows is coming. It, it is coming. Oh, yeah. they, they're already, they've already pretty much on the road of saying every month you got to pay so much in order to use your actual operating system. That's, That's just insane to me. The thing is, <laughs> you pay for Office already. Like, like, I'm sure if you use yeah. Windows, like you, you pay for Office 365. That thing's not cheap. And they're still putting advertisements and stuff in it, but I, we don't. I mean, that's completely off off the rails. But I'm gonna go back back and bitch about Windows here, anyways, because when I first switched to Linux, the first thing that I immediately thought, like when I actually switched in 2017, like I said, I sat there and opened Nautilus up over and over again because it was so fast. So I got the fast thing that Drew was that, and you guys were talking about. The fast thing was really good, but I think that. Looking back, Windows feels worse now than what I actually thought it was when I switched. And I, what I mean by that is that I remember just switching because my friend wanted to do a Linux podcast. I wasn't really, I didn't really at that point have anything against Windows. Windows was fine. It did a lot of gaming, stuff like that. It felt fine. But once I got into Linux and experienced how awesome Linux is and the it made me realize the annoyances that I had with Windows that I didn't even realize I had until I left it behind. Specifically things like being forced to reboot every time. And it's not even just like being forced to reboot, but you almost are always forced to reboot in the middle of doing something that you can't immediately get out of doing. Things like playing a game, like it would just pop up in the middle of a, 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 a gaming session, like, oh, you got to reboot. And oh, well, by the way, you don't have a choice. We're going to reboot in the next 45 seconds. And uh, if you don't manage to shut down and save whatever it is you're doing, sorry, Charlie, Charlie, right? And add on top of that, always having to mess around with reinstalling Windows over and over again whenever something went wrong. Because there was just usually, like I said, there was no way of fixing whatever it is went wrong. Or, and, and Windows was notorious for this, like you use it for a couple of months and it just starts slowing down further and further the longer that you use it so and the only way to fix that is to literally reinstall it and back before they had internet activation like like the internet activation they have now it's attached to your microsoft account because back then there wasn't really a microsoft account to go around you had to type in this long ass number and then you had and because i was never buying more than one key like ever in fact i still anytime i have to install windows i will start off installing windows 7 because i have a windows 7 key and then i'll just update to windows 10 or whatever and then windows 11 and you had like because you only have one i only had one key i had to always constantly lie my ass off and say it was you know only installed on one computer which they always believed you by the way 100 percent. i never at one time had anybody express any skepticism but I, I remember going to linux and not having to deal with any of that stuff and it was it was a revelation to the point where just recently, when the, the dude there in orange decided he was going to get me into DaVinci Resolve, and I had to figure out how to get that to work on Linux. And I couldn't do it, so I bought a computer with Windows on it. And I went back to Windows, and not only has it gotten worse, but if, I mean, okay, so it feels like it's gotten worse, because maybe it's not actually gotten worse, it's just that I com we co you come from Linux, where you don't have to deal with ads in the operating system, or constant notifications for VPNs, or one one uh, one drive or whatever, and it just feels like it was a constant bombardment of bullshit left and right. It was slow. It took eight gigabytes on idle to actually run. It was bonkers, um, and it just reminds me of those initial days there in Linux where it just felt, and this is gonna sound like the most cliche thing ever. It felt like freedom. And that it just got you completely away, away from all of the nonsense. And uh, it was just, uh, it was very weird. And it, it, it's even more weird looking back on it because it, feel, like, it feels like I have such poor memories of Windows when I switched. But if I dig up the memories a little bit more... I, I know that I didn't hate Windows when I switched to Linux. Like, I know I didn't. Like, like, I was perfectly fine. I switched because I wanted to do a podcast with a buddy. You know, that's the reason why I switched. But after I switched, it felt, it felt like I had, my opinion of Windows changed a lot more. So that's a, a little weird thing. So 
I, I guess the the next thing we want to talk about is once you the, you got onto that distro, that first distro that you tried, and I don't know if you guys are going to be able to remember this or not, but do you remember why you changed away? Why you distro hopped for the first time? So, like I said, maybe asking a little bit much in terms of memory, but we'll go around and we'll see if we can't bridge it up. So, Drew, what about you? What made you hop away from Linux Mint? I, well, there was a couple of reasons. One was I wanted, you know, it's like when something works, you want to say, is this the best there is? Because all I want to try is what's better. what's better than this. And so I think that I wanted to have something as light as possible. And when you do your Google search, like I was talking about before, and you say, I want to try some, you know, the lightest desktop environment on Linux, XFCE would come out quite a bit. And that was a, you know, that was kind of like, oh, let me try that. What is the best distribution for XFCE? Because you can go down this rabbit hole all day, you know? And at the time, so I tried a bunch of them. It was like Manjaro. All right, let me try that. Or, you know, even Linux Mint had an XFCE edition. And so, I, you know, you try that. And anyway, that was, the, that was the thought process. I wanted to get as light on resources as possible. Because if you're going to switch to Linux and you've already recognized how responsive it is, how light can it actually get and be even more responsive? And, and that's what brought me to, you know, okay, let's, let's, let's distro hop to our heart's content and really like say, okay, what's this about? What's that about? And, and I blame a lot of this on YouTube and including you, Matt, since you've blamed me on so many things, <laughs> I'm going to blame you back. I don't know what you're say, talking about. You know, when it's one of those things, when you see none of the YouTubers out there using Mint or Manjaro and they're using Arch. Oh, wow. Well, that's got to be the best, right? So then you, you make that switch as well. Can we talk about that for just a second? Uh, the, the whole Arch thing? Because absolutely, def definitely, if you pay attention to the Linux YouTuber sphere, Arch does seem to be like the only option. Like Brody uses it. DT uses a version of it. I don't know what Nick, I think Nick uses like Fedora or something like that these days, but I'm not actually sure. But if you just go around to a lot of the major Linux YouTubers, they use Arch Linux. And it feels like if, you know, you're a brand new user and you do fall into the horrible nonsense of looking for help on YouTube from Linux YouTubers, first off, you poor soul. <laughs> we are not the, the bastion of good advice. <laughs> but you know what's the, the funny thing is, it's like you look up to those guys. And so you think to yourself, well, they're cool. I want to be as cool as they are, you know? So you think, oh, wow, Arch has got to be the way, right? <laughs> I, I, I do, I'm just trying to imagine a universe where someone looks at me and says, you know what? That guy's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, you are a definite influence over, you know, when I was trying out Arch, because you have to admit, how long were you on Arch? You know? I was on Arch for a very long time. Yeah. That, uh, so just... To talk about that for a second, Arch has the AUR, and if you try the AUR, it has such, especially as a YouTuber where you try out software and you need to be able to have access to as much software as possible, the most recent version, having access to that AUR is a really big boon because there's not really another distro out there that has access to that much software almost immediately. Now, I mean, other distros have access to it but it usually takes a while so like if you want to use the latest version of kde probably arch is going to be the best option for you unless i mean e even on something like uh on gen 2 or whatever where you compile everything yourself it usually doesn't come into the repositories for a couple of weeks open suits the same same thing you know um manjaro is going to be delayed you know, fedora is going to be a little bit delayed right and like if you want to use the most recent version of something and you try even esoteric software arch does that i think that that's the reason why you see so many uh youtubers linux youtubers using arch but i don't think that that's the reason why anymore i think that that's more just they've fallen into using it and that's just what they use i think that that was more of a reason two or three years ago uh back um, maybe i just maybe i'm just watching the uh, the same linux youtubers over and over again they've kind of all gotten away from the whole trying new things over and over again so uh, maybe the smaller linux youtubers now are, are experiencing the same thing right yeah so nate what about you have you, you was your turn right i i 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, w- what made yep. you initially decide to distro hop off your that very first distro? So, funny enough, I don't know if you can hear my dogs barking, but anyways, funny enough for me <laughs> was I got challenged to install Arch, <laughs> and so y'all's little Arch branch <laughs> right there. I was like, I'm just going to keep quiet because, yeah, that was that was literally what challenged me to. I, I had a friend that was also a nerd, and he said. You're not a real Linux user. You got to use Arch. <laughs> so, out of spite for him, I installed Arch and ran it for a month, and instantly regretted installing <laughs> installing Arch. Went back to Ubuntu. Mm-hmm. Sounds about right. Yeah. All right. What about you, Tyler? What made you hop off from that initial distro? Seeing pictures online of people's custom races of like tiling window managers and some desktop environments at the time, like most new. Like Linux users, I believe that you probably had to be using something other than Ubuntu or, you know, Linux Mint, insert whatever distro here. I needed to be running something like Arch or whatever. And I think I started with trying Debian first because I knew I knew a whole bunch of people on different forums that were running Debian and swore by it. And for a long time, when I first was consistently using Linux and even into the portion of where I was doing YouTube. Debian hate hated me for the longest time. Like I there were I would always find some random small problem where I could like it, it would just annoy me. Like it wasn't like I couldn't use it, but it feels like when I first met you, Debian still hated you. It did. It did. And it, I don't know what it's been in the past like three to four years where it's decided maybe even less than that, but like it suddenly decided like it doesn't hate me anymore, um, which is good because Debian's a very good operating system. It's just, it didn't like me for the longest time. And so I ended up landing on Arch for kind of the same reason you were talking about. Like it's just the AUR, like any application I needed was there. So that's where I ended up, but it was solely the only reason I started distro hopping was I was like, I got to find a distro that lets me do all this crazy wild stuff that I see online. And it took a while, Uh, you know, because if you go to like any of those like red subreddits where you're going to see a whole bunch of riced out systems, you're not just going to click, get a one click download and be able to customize everything there without any knowledge. Like you're, you're going to have to slowly work through. How do I find my, a custom wallpaper setter? How do I, find a taskbar how do i customize the taskbar you know does it use xml because god i remember that trying to customize the taskbar in xml and if you didn't know what xml was at all or like you know read one paragraph on what xml was didn't help you at all like it's gonna be a while i remember xml wasn't too bad but you know if you want to do a real fancy custom taskbar like yeah you kind of needed to know your stuff so yeah all right so my reason is stupid so i was a dumbass and at that point i was a complete and utter noob i had no clue what i was doing and budgie is a good desktop environment but it's not the only desktop environment and i have a monster sized version of add I can't stick with, at least at that point, I couldn't stick on anything for any period of time. But I was not in the know that you could install all the things on the distro that you were using. I had no clue that if I wanted to install KDE, I could do that on Ubuntu. Budgie, I could do that very easily. These days, I would even know how to do it. But then I had no clue that you could do that. So I figured that there was a, you know, if I wanted to use KDE, if I wanted to try Mate, if I wanted to try, you know, at that point it was Unity, um, or if I wanted to try, you know, uh, XFCE, I had I had this distro hop. So when I finally got my fill of Budgie, I decided I was going to install Kubuntu, which is, you know, <laughs> funny because they're both based on the exact same thing, right? And I think that I switched back and forth between Ubuntu flavors probably every other week for a year. Now, I did eventually mix that up with some other distros because I still had that stupid idea where if I wanted to try something that was done 
differently with a different desktop environment, I had to use a different distro. Now, eventually I did realize that you could install things alongside it along the way, but it always felt easier to me just to wipe things clean, start over with a new distro with someone else's interpretation of a desktop environment, because they're all kind of a little bit different because they have different things installed, maybe a different theme or whatever. And, you know, and that's the reason why I got into onto my distro hopping thing, because I would use something, it would work really well, but I would go see, you know, like you said, Tyler, I'd go see a Unix porn of somebody doing a really awesome plasma rice or whatever and think, well, you know, I want to do something like that, but I don't know that it's going to work on this distro. So I might as well, you know, try some random distro that I found on distro watch, you know, and my life was one install of Linux after another for several years, like even like up to last year, really, to be honest with you. Like, yeah, the distance between distro hops grew as time went on. That's true. Like, I used things for months instead of just weeks or days, which I think is good. But it really wasn't until I decided to challenge myself to use a single distro for two years that I finally got to the point where I can, you know, just live on a distro. And, and don't, I don't, right now, I don't really look at any other distro and think, you know what? That distro does things better than what I'm currently using and in a different way. It doesn't mean that I don't still have interest in other distros. Like I, I've been messing around with Bluefin. You know, I, I we, we talked about Nabara last week. You know, I still try other distros, but the whole grass is greener on the other side thing has really faded away. I don't know if that's because I like OpenSUSE so much or if it's just I'm, I've gotten older and I'm no longer interested in... Um, ruining my system just because they happen to have a you know a better implementation of plasma or whatever. I, I don't know if that which one is which, but I I I think that that initial hop. I have no clue by by the way if it was Kubuntu that I hopped to. I I couldn't tell you. I just know that it was a Ubuntu flavor of some kind. My only argument for for actually doing the hop was that I wanted to try a different desktop environment and thought I had to switch to a different dis distro to do it, and that's um, a silly reason to do things. But it's that's just the truth. Okay, let's see what else did I have on the outlines. All right, so the last one that I have, just real quickly, is uh, have you used the first one since? Have you been back to the one that you your your first love? Drew, what about you? Um, no. Um, I am, as most of you know, I am a Debian user. By the way, Tyler, I did want to mention that I, I think I watched a video of yours when you actually did videos. And um, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sorry, that was troll. That was oh, completely no. I troll. Mean, come on, man. You know, that was that was totally. But it was a live. It was a live video. And I watched you do a Debian install, BSPWM. No bar. I think I've told you this before, maybe. Yeah. And it was awesome. It was, it was. awesome. <laughs> it really and, was. And that was the, I mean, that's the reason why. Okay. Uh, let me just say, no, I haven't gone back to uh, Linux Mint. And the reason why is because I want to cherry pick every single package. I don't want there to be like a bunch of stuff installed. I don't want there to be a desktop environment. I don't. I just want, so I really only have, I guess there's two major choices. I can install Arch or I can install Debian, both net installs and start from there. And that's, that's really what I have gravitated towards. I want to be as light as possible. I want to cherry pick every single package. And that's the reason why I haven't been back to, uh, to Mint. Fellas, we have got to challenge Drew to a Gen 2 install. I'm just saying... That's got to happen. <laughs> and he he has to make at least one video on it. <laughs> It'd be better if he could do it live. That would be yeah. incredible. <laughs> oh, my God. My blood pressure might not make it. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be like, please let there be a hurricane. Please let there be a hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, he wouldn't need that. He could just run out in the yard with clippers and cut the line. It, it, it can't be go as bad as my first live Gen 2 install where I had nine people in the chat trying to help me install it nine different ways. 
Oh well, god, that was horrible. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember you like I I thought you might kill us. Like <laughs> I was contemplating murder of Josh many times in that during that live stream. <laughs> like, come on, man. You do things in a different way. Everyone's like, oh, you gotta do it this way. No, you're doing it wrong. That's not the way that I do it. You gotta do it a different way. Oh like, uh, can, I, can I just follow the fucking directions? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's so bad. All right, Nate. What about you? What do you, have you been back to Ubuntu? I, I think it, your, that was your first one, right? Was Ubuntu? Have you been back since to use it uh, at any period of time over the whatever? Yeah, I actually uh, did Ubuntu a few months ago, and I did not like it at all. I felt like they completely lost uh, what was good about them because basically now they're completely focused on server stuff. Which means their desktop is lacking, for a better sense, and um, and I do understand that they do have to make money and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it'd be nice if they would remember what they used to be and how good they were as a desktop, versus you know, just focus on one little small part. I think if they want to go back to being a better desktop for all users, that'd be nice. Because right now, what's beating them is Linux Mint, Pop OS, MX Linux, Endeavor. You know, all that kind of stuff is beating them right now, and it's just a fact. I miss Unity quite a lot. I, I it feels like yeah. it feels like Ubuntu was better when they had their own desktop environment. When, when we're actually innovating and trying to make that better, now they're just using GNOME, and they have to fight GNOME every inch of the way trying to get that to be usable. Um, so they spend all of their time fighting with GNOME, and then they have no time to do anything else. And then they chose Snaps. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. What about you, Tyler? Do you uh, have you been back to whatever it is you started with? I've, I've forgotten. What, it's Ubuntu, Ubuntu right? and literally as soon as you said snaps, I'm like, well, there there goes the surprise. I uh, I can't do snaps. I can't. I know they've gotten better, but once Ubuntu decided to use snaps, the option of going to check it out every new release and see how things were, like I never went back to it and used it. But I'd always check it out to see like what was new, what was improved. Yeah, that's done for. I'm not interested in running an entire... I'm kind of like Drew. I want to cherry pick the apps that I have. And if pretty much my only option is snaps, especially if I want a package that's not going to potentially break the system, which is so dumb, but I won't even go into that. Uh, I'll, I'd rather not. I'm not interested in using snaps for everything. I'm not one of those people that has a specific application that doesn't work unless it's a snap. So, no, I'll pass. And also, Ubuntu's done a lot of decisions that I don't agree with. I mean, you brought up the Unity desktop. They, I get it. It was not the best when they discontinued it, but you could have fixed it. And, you know, a, a big thing, too, that kind of made, made me not interested in trying to actually go back to Ubuntu and make it a daily driver was the whole Amazon snafu. Like once that happened, uh, I really wasn't interested in having my systems search for local stuff, searching to Amazon for products. Like that's not what I'm interested in at all. So, okay. So I guess it depends on where you consider. So my first one, when I switched to Linux full-time, Ubuntu Budgie, no, I haven't used Ubuntu Budgie in, I mean, is it even still a thing? I don't even know. Yeah, yeah so. it's actually pretty good, too. Okay, I'll, I'll have to take your word on it. Minus the snaps. Because I, <laughs> yeah. I haven't I haven't tried it. I haven't tried Budgie in several years. Now, if you, if you go all the way back to 2002 with that SUSE, technically, I'm using OpenSUSE right now. I know, I know, not the same thing, but derivative, I suppose. But yeah, but yeah, the Ubuntu budget thing. I, I and the thing is, my turn away from Ubuntu wasn't really because of anything Ubuntu did. It's just that Arch exists. You know what I mean? I I could never justify using Ubuntu, which felt slow and outdated, and constantly like out of phase with everything else when Arch was there. And it always felt to me silly, like even when I contemplated switching away from Arch to go to Ubuntu and have to suffer with those problems when Debian existed, right? Because Debian ha does everything that Ubuntu does, but without the extra cruft that Ubuntu shoves on top of it, right? You can do 
all of the things you would do with Ubuntu with Debian. You have access to all of the same packages and stuff, but you don't have to deal with any of the nonsense that Canonical shoves in there. And so one of the reasons why I haven't gone back to ever gone back to an Ubuntu based distro is just because of all that stuff. And I also have, I was a big proponent of Arch based distros for a long time. So like I started on Arco as an Arco for a long time. I, I actually started actually use Antigos before that, but it died almost immediately the moment I touched it and the project just went away. And, and then I used Manjaro for a little while and Endeavor and whatever. So I really liked the Arch based distros. It was easy to install. Usually they put together a much more cohesive collection of packages pre-installed, which always made them feel like they were easier to use than regular Arch. Because always when you install Arch for that first time, uh, at least before Arch install, there was a period about two weeks after your 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 Arch install that you had to oh, like, oh, I forgot to install this and forgot to install that. So you were always in, constantly installing packages for those last that that week after you installed because you've forgotten to install something during that installation. So you're always using a a, a Arch based distro kind of solved that problem for me a lot of the times. But the Ubuntu based distros have never been attractive to me. Like it, it just feels like it's every step away from Debian that you get, it feels dirtier. And I don't know why that, like, like one of the reasons why I've always had problems with Linux Mint, like it, it just adds an abstraction layer on top of everything else. Like Linux Mint itself, without the, focusing on the Debian edition, is a base on Ubuntu, which itself is based on Debian. It feels like a Xerox copy. Every time you copy something, it degrades in quality, right? And that's, that's what a... What a Ubuntu based distro feels like to me and maybe it's not fair but that's just the way that it always felt to me like it just feels like it's not something that it ever really interests me like I'm just going to use this I'm going to use the mothership you know what I mean and that's the way that it always kind of was for me I think you're staring into Nate's soul right now with Papa Wes <laughs> I, mean, I think I'm <laughs> going to I'm going to defend me and War Thunder here for a second hold on <laughs> <laughs> the fact of the matter is Linux Mint actually makes Ubuntu more usable for most users. And the, also, Pop! OS makes GNOME usable for most users. And so there's a reason why they are very popular. And also, if you have a NVIDIA GPU, unlike your OpenSUSE, which you can't hardly do crap on, um, it just works. Whoa, whoa shots All fired. Right. Okay, <laughs> first off, I do plenty on OpenSUSE just fine. Thank you very much. But also, I... I think that someone was a mighty bit defensive there. I never said <laughs> that Mint or Pop were bad. I said that I had an. You just said they degraded, and I'm like, Wait I a said I had an <laughs> abstraction <laughs> layer after abstraction I, layer. I yeah. said I had a feeling about wh why those things are bad. A feeling, not something that was objective. It was. It's an a subjective feeling about it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's fact. So calm down. Well, to, to be <laughs> honest, you're actually also not wrong either. And like, honestly, if you really want to break it down, there's only really, what, four distros that you really should be technically running, which is Debian, Arch, OpenSUSE, and what, Slackware, technically, if you wanted to really break it down. So, well, I mean, if we're looking or in June for like... Or and whatever else. Yeah, if we're looking for like the OGs yeah. that are still going on, the basis... Yeah. Pretty much, like there's uh, there's only a handful of them. Yeah, you're not you're not wrong. Well, I mean, if you, if you, th I mean, okay. So let let me just defend my take there for just a second. With Linux Mint specifically, uh, Ubuntu is old. Okay, it's just way the way the release cycle works, right? Like you don't get new stuff immediately. Like, especially if you've got the the the, the LTS or whatever, which is what Mint is based on. So not only do they have to wait for the LTSs to come out for something new, come out specifically things like the kernel and hardware, hardware enablement and stuff like that. Now, they've gotten better at patching that stuff in mid-release cycle, but it didn't used to be that way. But it just feels like not only do you have to wait for Ubuntu to get this stuff, but then you have to wait for the Linux Mint devs to put all this stuff in. And, I mean, just, I mean, 
Yeah, most people don't care about that stuff. Like, most people don't care if they're using a kernel. I mean, look at Drew. He's, what are you using? Like, 4.19 right now still? Yeah. <laughs> it's a 5. Dot, no, I'm just It's 6.1 <laughs> something or other. And he'll yeah. be using that for the next 10 years. So he didn't, a lot of people don't care. But for me, especially when you come from Arch, who gets every kernel immediately, like, on the day of release... And, and I mean, who cares really? I mean, even I don't care that I get it, but it felt like you're getting something. And then you go to that and it's just constantly, not only is it delayed by Ubuntu being having, you having to really wait for the LTS, but then you have to wait for another, you know, development team to actually put things in. Now, it's not as bad as it used to be because now, like, Pop! OS, at one point, they, were, they waited for the LTS to get the new kernels and stuff like that. But now they started using their own kernels or whatever and started pushing things forward. So you don't have to wait nearly as long. But a lot of the software is still reliant on Ubuntu repositories and a lot of that stuff is old. But you got to remember, that's from a perspective of a rolling release guy, right? And if you're a rolling release guy, it's a different perspective on the world, right? It's just you're used to getting stuff the minute that it comes out. And I'm not as bad as I used to be. Like, OpenSUSE doesn't get brand new stuff instantaneously. There's a good good delay on almost everything that comes out. So it's not, I'm not as bad as it used to be. I do want to make a correction. Technically, it is factually incorrect that OpenSUSE is crap. It's actually a really nice distro. I just like giving Matt crap about it. Nate and I, FYI, we, just for everybody out there. <laughs> we troll each other a lot, but really we don't. I mean, Pop! OS is a fine distribution. Um, if it pop yeah. OS, guys, if it, it, uh, system 76, if you guys, guys want to send me, uh, one of your, uh, computers to review <laughs> and keep, I'd happily do it. I would provide glowing reviews about pop OS. <laughs> I would use that thing. He would like, shill it up just to get a, I, a free I, I PC get, out of it. I'd get myself a hat. I'd get a t-shirt that said pop OS on it. I would be Nate 2.0. I'd get myself some monitors with the pop OS logo behind me, you know, <laughs> All you got is when people do. mention Open Sousa to him, he'd be like, "I don't know what that is." What is Never this Open heard Sousa of which you speak? I don't even have the <laughs> sticker on my microphone anymore. <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. All right. Uh, anything else you guys want to talk about in terms of the whole nostalgic thing that we just went through? Or are we all done with that? We done? Anybody else going once? Going Thank twice? You. All right. Let's go ahead then and move on to the nuggies of the week now. Uh, seeing as how the culprit of this name is actually here tonight, uh, mm -hmm. th that douchebag down there on the lower left-hand side is the reason why this section, <laughs> this, section this section, is called the Nuggies of the Week. Because he, he is my friend, but he hates my guts. Because I, ha I hate the word Nuggies. But we've kept it. And we thought, seeing as, as payback for you not being here the last few weeks, that we were going to change it back to something different, but we didn't. So, Tyler, I don't know if you, if you even have one, uh, but do you have a Nuggie of the Week for us? I do. Excellent. I do. What you got? Oh, all right. So I'm going first. Yeah. Okay. So mine is Audacity only because I had tried a few other options here recently, and I got to be honest, have y'all, have you, out of curiosity, in the time that we've spoken, have any of you tried using anything else? No. Like, mm -hmm. recently? No, not recently. Yes. Okay. Nate, what have you tried recently? Oh, Lord. Um, just for audio? Yeah, just for audio. Just for audio recording. <laughs> it's so funny enough, I used Reaper. I used, uh, was it L L M M? Yes. I believe it's what it's called. Yeah. Uh, I've used uh, RR. I've used um, just straight up uh, OBS Studio uh -huh. by itself. Um, and I used something else. And I can't remember the name of it. It's uh, the thing that like you DJ, installed. DJ like... <laughs> Mix or something like that. I can't remember. It's like DJ Mix XX or something. I've I tried it. It was terrible. All right, so the last time I was messing around with audio on Linux, I tried LMMS, or LMMS, mm -hmm. whatever it's called. Yeah. Uh, that is more like a, a somewhat trying to be, like, logic in Linux. Like, it's not, it's way too complex just to record audio. I mean, it kind of works, but not for just doing a simple audio recording. Our door, or however you're supposed to say it, to me, seems like a, like a, 2004 implementation of a music recording app it doesn't function well at least for me it didn't 
I mean, I've heard people use it a lot, and it's good. Couldn't get it to work right. Um, Audacity had been giving me problems. Uh, I mean, Matt can attest to this. I've had many issues with Audacity. It has improved so much so my recording and playback devices never get mixed up any. Like, just, it doesn't get mixed up anymore at all. Uh, Things just work, which has been really good the only downside i can say about audacity is where's the ui update like i swear to god we were talking about this years ago stuff looked old and then you're gonna go audacity looks like brand new (laughs) yeah have you guys noticed though that it has been slow slowly like if you looked from uh, when the the music score group first bought it it looked way different than it does now yeah it looks the same but they've have modernized it a little bit it's not quite as skeuomorphic as it was yeah, now it's, it's not like just a touch it's not like this gigantic redesign but it has gotten better go ahead nate so think about it this way you have windows 98 all blocks but now it's kind of more like windows xp with the rounded corners yeah that's huh. literally what it looks like yeah the, yeah but the like the the weird thing that gets me about audacity is like even though they're They're clearly trying to improve the UI, but it seems like the whoever's doing the UI for Audacity is like very timid, and they're like, "All right, so I'm going to try just rounding this corner here. Maybe let's change the background a little bit, make it a little bit more like readable." I don't know what the heck you're talking about, Tyler. I'm on uh, Pulse Audio and Audacity three two four right now, so. Well, I don't know, oh, what, you're wow. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you Debian users. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. <laughs> wow. All right. But yeah, that's my nuggy of the week. Okay. But Nate, does what, it work? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yours probably works better than ours because we had to deal with all those probably. newfangled features. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Drew's like, what a UI refresh? Mine still looks the same as it always has. <laughs> Absolutely. It totally right. does. For Nate, the last what? two years, it's looking exactly the same. <laughs> Nate, your nuggy of the week. So mine is an actual another hardware piece. I have right here, it is a PS2 keyboard and mouse to USB converter adapter. Mm-hmm. And the reason why this is great is because I have recently gotten into a new hobby of not building custom keyboards anymore. I am now buying old keyboards. And so when it comes with old keyboards, you have things like this, that is just all kinds of weird. And Uh I love it just because it's weird. And then you have things like this, that looks like an old IBM keyboard. And I also love it because it's very clicky and Trying to get it to actually, like, finding a system now that actually has a PS2 port. Back in the day, for a long time, you had desktops that always came with at least one. And sometimes they were like a combo, so it was a mouse and keyboard type thing. Trying to find a system nowadays that actually has one just doesn't work. And so having this adapter has been almost a godsend. This stays in my tech bag. I never go without it. Because even today, like if I go somewhere and I carry one of my keyboards, I'd much rather use this than, you know, some fancy wireless keyboard just because well, I mean, I'm weird. Also, but, if you ever asked to work on somebody's old computer, yep. I mean, that's perfect. Yep. And and I like the fact, too, because it does have the, the mouse part of it with it. So I have one of those old, old uh, Microsoft, oh, what do they call them things? But the white one oh, the, the big first ball? optical ones yeah, it, yeah it's yeah. the one of the first optical ones that you could use and like move so i have one of those and it works well the one with it the red light on well. the bottom yes oh yeah i had that my mouse everyone yep. had that mouse and when, yep. at one point you, you, you your computer would go off but you'd, you'd still be able to see the red light underneath your mouse just to know everything was so that was a light. strong light too. yeah it's, that was extremely it strong light. it would hurt your room. eyes if you looked yeah. at it <laughs> i remember that good lord remember the days when microsoft made good i like if you wanted a good mouse microsoft was like the company to go to at one point they had that um like that arc mouse that you could fold up i still have that mouse somewhere Good Lord. 
we, we should do a whole episode just on mice and keyboards. <laughs> that'd, be awesome. yeah, that'd, be a, that'd be a good episode. Yeah. Talk, talk about nobody watching because we're completely niche. Um, anyways, Drew, what about your Nuggie of the Week? My Nuggie of the Week is a piece of FOSS that is called PDF Arranger. Okay. PDF Arranger, it allows you to merge PDF files, split PDF files, rearrange the pages of the PDF that you're working on, rotate pages, extract pages. Um, it is simple. It is lightweight. It is really, really stinking good. I had a use case come up this week and I'm like, I need to, you know, I need to like rearrange the pages of this PDF document. And it was like, boom, done. And, uh, and so I thought that was a excellent excellent piece of software so pdf arranger is my nuggy of the week nice can you send that to me please yes <laughs> i avoid pdf so hopefully <laughs> i won't need it but if i do i will hit you up yeah same i i, I if i see pdf i just like what i i'm i'm i immediately i'd rather install um what well, god i completely lost the name of it was it's based on haskell you use At it use it oh, to change oh. it's pandoc that's it i just installed pandoc to, to to convert it to something else that's what i'll that that's the length i'll go to to avoid a pdf <laughs> installing the entire haskell library <laughs> all right so my nuggy of the week i mentioned it earlier just real quick i have decided i am a hugo fanboy uh i really like this piece of software it's really really good and I didn't like it at first because I've been using Eleventy for the last couple of years. Yours set me up with an Eleventy blog for the main site, and uh, it was good. Like it, it was very good for a little while, and then they moved to updating the dependencies for version three point oh. But version three point oh wasn't actually out yet, so all of your dep my dependencies were broken, and I couldn't update the site anymore. So I moved the the main website over to Hugo. And actually, I think that I had just finished doing that the last time Tyler was on the podcast because we talked about Hugo a little bit. Um, since then, I've finished all of that. It's really, really good. And I decided to start my own personal blog. Now, I've been on a little bit of an adventure with the per person whole personal blog thing because when the, WordPre the WordPress controversy first started, it looked like Matt Mullenweg was the good guy, right? He came out. He said that WordPress engine needed to pull their weight in order to contribute back to the project because they weren't doing so. And I was like, yeah. Why aren't you guys contributing back after using the trademark and, you know, making money off the main project? Why aren't you doing this? So I'm going to sign up for WordPress. And like two weeks later, it turns out that Matt Mullenweg is an asshole. <laughs> I mean, he's just kind of a douchebag. So uh, that was a mistake. So I decided I'm going to move away from WordPress after being there for like uh, three weeks and just host it myself and use Hugo to do so. So, yeah, if you want a static blog generator, there are like... 12 dozen of these things out there and they're all varying levels of different in terms of like what they're coded in like you know 11 like um jekyll's one thing and 11 is another and hugo's another and how you do them all they vary like some of them are ruby and you got to worry about gems and you got to wor worry about or some of them are go um so I find Hugo really good because not only is it in every repository, so you just download the damn thing, but also it's like three lines to set up. That's all you got to do. And it's just very, very good in terms of the ease, ease of setup. You can just use a GitHub or GitLab page in order to host it. You don't have to worry about going to find yourself a WordPress host or, a, or whatever. It, it's just so easy. So yeah, highly recommend Hugo. I know I'm very, very late to that party. Like every Linux YouTuber out there has done a video on YouTube about Hugo. Yeah, uh, I haven't and I won't. Like there's no need for me to do to, that's That's a horse that has been beaten uh, to death. So I don't need to do it myself. But just to know, I'm finally on board, guys. I'm one of the members. Like, what are you, oh, you guys are using something different now? Damn. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So that is it for the Linux cast. Thanks everybody who watched us live. If you too would like to watch us live, we record this live every Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time on youtube.com slash the Linux cast. We have a fantastic time. We do pay attention to the chat. We don't always interact with it because if we did, the tangents would be a hundred times worse. Uh, we would never get anything done. So while we do read it, we don't always interact with it, but we do have a, a fantastic time. If you can't catch us live, though, the edited version comes out every Saturday evening, uh, and that is edited by Mr. Nate. So there you go. Um, if you want to watch or listen to that, they'll be on YouTube and also on every podcast service that you could possibly imagine. 
Uh, I've spent a significant amount of time making sure that my podcast is everywhere that you want it to be. So uh, if you do listen to this on Apple Podcasts, I would really, really be really happy if you went and left us a review and actually typed something in to to leave that review. Give us a star rating and a review. It would really help us out because it would move us up in the rankings and make us the best Linux podcast on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Screw you, Jupiter Podcasting. Nobody likes you. Um, let's put that <laughs> I don't, I don't even know those guys. I just want to beat them. Um, <laughs> anyways, leave us a review. Uh, that's it for this one. Uh, so if you want to get in contact with, with us, the best way to do so is email. That's email at the linuxcast.org. You can find all of our, uh, rest of our contact information at the linuxcast.org slash contact. Drew is on YouTube. He has a YouTube channel. He's at youtube.com slash just guy Linux. Stay tuned for that next cloud uh, video very, very soon. It's going to be awesome. Tyler, I don't know what he has anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. He has a YouTube I have a dusty YouTube channel. <laughs> he, has a, he has a YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash ZanyoG. It hasn't been up to, updated in like a year because he got himself a girlfriend. And that's just more important, apparently. Whatever. Uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Oh, I, I don't listen to that, Tyler. Don't listen to any of the previous podcasts because I talked some shit while you weren't here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure you did. Yep. I was like, where the fuck is it that It was guy? relentless. <laughs> uh, every time I was like, oh, it, t- Tyler was not here again. <laughs> and then I said things. Not One of them were not very nice. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the first one was girlfriend. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> well, it had to be done. <laughs> Anyways, that, that's just those of you guys who said I wouldn't say it to his face. I just did. OK, we know mm-hmm. she actually mm-hmm. exists, but it's just funny because it, it's a stereotype. OK, I, why am I explaining this to you guys? Anyways, uh, Nate also is on YouTube at uh, Nate Pick Tech World. Uh, did I get that right? I'm going to ask you Nate this. Picks tech Nate world, but picks yes. Tech world. Link is in the description below. Yeah. Don't trust me to, to actually spell that out. He needs to simplify that thing. Just call it at Nate. He just like needs to be like Mr. Nate or something like Mr. Beast or whatever. All right. Um, now that I've had, had I, I'd have to have money before I could do that though. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just well, we, when, when, th- there's the low hanging fruit of sell one of your monitors, but <laughs> <laughs> Drew, I know, Drew. I know. <laughs> My heart already hurts. <laughs> My bad. My bad, dude. <laughs> Rude. Uh, anyways, that's it for this one. We will see you guys next week when we talk about whatever it is we talk about. So we'll see you then. Bye.